Good evening, and welcome to the spring program of the 41st Greater Lafayette Holocaust Remembrance Conference. I am Sarah Cowley, Chair of the Greater Lafayette Holocaust Remembrance Committee. Our speaker tonight, Tibor Spitz, tells a double harrowing story of surviving the Holocaust and then of escaping the communist regime in Czechoslovakia after that. When he was 68, Mr. Spitz became a full-time artist. He has produced over 600 works in various media. His work has been widely ex exhibited in the United States and abroad. And we are fortunate to have him with us tonight to help us understand how vital the arts are and how important they can be in helping individuals recover from trauma, isolation, injustice. Mr. Spitz's presentation will be followed by a question and answer opportunity facilitated by Associate Professor of History at Purdue University and Director of the Human Rights Program, Dr. Rebecca klein Pesheva. And after the presentation and for the Q&A session, Mr. Spitz will be joined by his wife, Noemi, who is also a Holocaust survivor. And now, speaking to us from his home in New York, Mr. Tibor Spitz. Thanks for the introduction. And as tightly saying what you are going to see, the slideshow takes three sections of 20 minutes. Uh, all paintings, art, and sculptures you will see were made by me, and this is part of the healing process. Uh, I'm now 92. I was 15 when the war was over in 1945. Uh, who was 10 years older, let's say 25, would be over 100 years old, and uh, 35 old people at that time would be over 110 which means that it's not a really, it's, a, it's becoming a rarity to speak, to let speak somebody who was there. Uh, I was born in Czechoslovakia in 1929, and you see it in, on the map in the red. Uh, on the left-hand side are Czech lands and middle Slovakia, and it was a piece of Ruthenia there. Uh, Czechoslovakia was a democratic country, something like America, and uh, there were no differences between rights, human rights, legal rights of people, regardless of religion, nationality, minorities, uh, so on, which means that we lived there practically free uh, from any point of view you can imagine. Uh, Our ancestors lived in Europe for hundreds of years, uh, and uh, they were practically two major religions. If I consider Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, three major religions, except that Jews were only about 2% of the European population. Uh, again, there were no differences in theology or some kind of conflict. Uh, Christians believe Messiah is coming back and returning, and Jews believe that Messiah, Messiah would come one day. Uh, we, my father, accepted a job in a community of 100 families, but it was very high, in the very high mountains, uh, 5,000 feet tall. Uh, even if you see green grass on uh, the field, it might be fall. Uh, in the background, they are it's snow on the peaks. On the left-hand side picture, it's even sh shown e easier. Uh, uh, it was a county seat, small town, we call it town, but there were only 2,000 people living there. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a synagogue, on the right-hand side too. But to second house from it was a Protestant church and a little bit further, a Catholic church, which means that uh, what I'm saying is there were no real differences. Uh, and conflicts between people of different religions or origins. Uh, this is a picture taken in 1936, before the Holocaust. You see my father, a reverend, 
a cantor of the Jewish congregation. My father, my mother is a middle a teacher, and my brother, two years older, on the to, uh, on the top, and my younger sister on, on the right. I'm on the extreme left. Uh, we received our religious education mostly at home because there were not enough Jewish children to have a Jewish school, which means I went to a regular school. Uh, we uh, children we were aware that we belong to a very ancient culture, thousands of years old, uninterrupted with a lot of literature and opinions and uh, all kinds of surviving stories because within 4,000 years, almost 4,000 years, a lot of things happen. This is uh, our, our photographs from my three um, elementary classes. I only attended five, and then I couldn't go to school for five years. Uh, again, teachers treated us equal, <coughs> equally. There were about 40 to 50 kids in each class, and there were only two Jews, one girl be next uh, besides me. Uh, Jews were a very, very tiny minority. Even now, it's about one Jew to 640 other people. Can you imagine? 0.15% of the world population. But European Jews were about 2%, and they had extremely high literature. You've seen that uh, uh, pie uh, graph, uh, Christians about one-third of the world population, Muslims about one-fifth might have changed in the meantime. And here on the top, 0.2% is almost the same size as a line uh, drawn in between them. Uh, European Jews were educated, very successful, and uh, Churchill told about the Jews, no thoughtful man can doubt the fact that Jews are beyond all questions the most formidable and the most remarkable race which has ever appeared in the world. As he said in the 1920s, but success uh, of Jews insulted Hitler. And when he got into power, uh, he, uh, he decided to wipe out that competition because he believes that Germans are the master race and should be uh, masters of all humankind and the rest should be either slaves or, or vanished. And uh, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf in 1924, published in 1925. And when he became a chancellor of Germany in 1933, uh, he very clearly said that he would replace population of Slavic Poland and Russia first, but also Anglo-Saxons, uh, French, he called the generated, generated people. And all colored people would certainly be wiped out as undesirables. Uh, people didn't understand that he might try to implement it because it's also unbelievably uh, uh, unusual. They believed that he was bluffing and exaggerated as a politician. Uh, but he said if somebody would uh, oppose him, not only Jews, somebody would oppose him, his plans, he would wipe out the Jews first. And then when 1938 came, uh, it became an eye-opener, and people, my mother started remembering uh, the terrible book we, where he was very specific, and nobody really uh, considered it as realistic. Uh, they believed that there were some fantasies or some possibly threats, empty threats. Uh, in 1938, what's called Kristallnacht, because uh, suddenly thousands, 7,000 Jewish businesses, glass was broken into, uh, hundreds of synagogues set on fire, and 30,000 uh, Jewish German civilians arrested and sent into a concentration camp, which means that it started showing that it was not a bluff, and it was a real thing. And this happened in the whole Germany, very well synchronized and planned, and in Austria. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, which was a neighboring country next to Germany, and even Austria, uh, the government was against uh, German aggression and 
I really wanted to defend their country in case of uh, some kind of a neighbor would try to attack it. And, uh, but came British Premier Chamberlain in the same year, 38, and he talked to Hitler and believed that he, if that Hitler wouldn't start a war if he gives him what he wanted. And he wanted those dark purple areas of Czechoslovakia where minorities, German speaking minorities lived. When uh, that Munich agreement uh, came about and uh, he received what he wanted, he took over Bohemia uh, and uh, helped Slovakia, which is here in blue on the map, to be independent country. And because it was independent uh, through uh, Hitler's political manipulations, they became allies, very strong allies to Nazi Germany. Naturally, uh, here you see how president of the country on the right is shaking hand and with Hitler and, uh, and naturally he uh, promised for total cooperation and help of little Slovakia to Germany, and Hitler accepted it with great pleasure because it allowed him to start slicing up Europe and prepare situation for his attacks. Uh, this is a book, my Kampf, and uh, naturally it was translated in Slovak and uh, all ideology uh, written in this book was accepted as facts. Naturally, Slovak Jews were trapped. Uh, and uh, uncertainty came about, nobody knew what and which form would take that persecution and those threats, because it all looked uh, unreal. A Slovak version of a Nuremberg laws, which are anti-Jewish laws, definition, who is a Jew, uh, made it full Jew was a four, had to have four Jewish uh, grandparents, uh, Michelin or mixed Grace were two, two Jewish grandparents and so on, which means that they accepted it and even made it more, more, more strict, more uh, so-called Jews. Uh, became, so so uh, many people be, uh, got into the category of becoming Jewish and because it was just a prepare, prepare, preparing to rob those people of property and situation uh, show, has shown uh, what to do with them later. Uh, this uh, made us feel like this is a little like uh, only works in English. You remember Fiddler on the Roof? And this is Fiddler on the Hoof. Uh, if Fiddling sitting on the top of the uh, roof is uncertain enough, but on a walking or gall galloping horse, it's much more, more difficult. The uh, problem was that not everybody understood that the danger was real. You know, in this painting, I was showing a boy playing with his train and behind him uh, something uh, which might uh, kill him and eat him, you know, any moment. Uh, and this was a situation. People were uh, educated and very nice and believed in reciprocity. Uh, as if they said, expect the lion not to eat you because you didn't eat him. No, lion would eat you anyway. Uh, uh, but it started really showing in a very bad way demonstrations, you know, like stones started throw, being thrown into Jewish businesses and homes and the windows and, and uh, very noisy threats against, because it's, Jews were harmless, helpless, unarmed, an extremely small minority. If two people are harmed in a room filled with 100 people, you know, it's, you don't even notice. And this is what uh, Hitler was playing with because he could share the loot of Jewish properties and got, get some cooperation and sympathy. Uh, we looked like any other people on the street. Nobody could see on the street like in American street. You don't know what religions those people are which means they had to mark us, and they did it with about four-inch white star, which we had to wear. Uh, here it is shown on the left-hand side of uh, upper, uh, outer clothing, and had to be 
sewn very tightly, not uh, removable, was not removable. In Czech lands, it had a word Jude in it, and in Slovakia, it was like a text without any. Uh, this is my last class. Uh, I was at top here uh, with the X. I was always the smallest in the class. We were about 50 to 60 uh, children. And um, we were all treated equally. I don't remember any persecution or any uh, comments or anything. Naturally, boys were making fun of each other, including me, and we were fighting as boys with no uh, really uh, any ideological backgrounds. Uh, population naturally was prepared to wipe out uh, the Jewish race, as they said, and they accused us of uh, poisoning wells and causing epidemics and making human misery and poverty. Every, we were guilty of everything, including bad weather, but nobody died, even if so, we so-called poisoned things, and nobody uh, really was missing, so that we didn't kidnap children and so on. It was all propaganda and this is what was based, uh, the whole ideology was based on just repeating lies. Uh, we uh, hoped that we could run away and so on, but even United States and England refused to intervene or help us. And as you see on those pictures, it looks like a sad and desperate situation. Uh, when they kicked us out of school, we had to make a school. In that small town, there were 24 kids between the age of 6 to 14. And we uh, had to uh, build a building. A, uh, a lawyer who was not allowed to practice his profession was uh, his office we used and uh, made, made a school. And my mother here in the middle uh, was a teacher. And my older brother and younger sister were part of this group. Uh, and this was a class of 1940-41, which means that the following year uh, started simply, in the following year, they didn't live anymore. The population of Europe collaborated with the Nazis because they shared the loot. And uh, they were winning on all France, as you see on this map, yellow, the yellow part are Nazis. The Nazi German armies already occupied uh, East, East Europe, West Europe, uh, and even they were in North Africa. Uh, this was, uh, and there were a few so-called neutral countries, Sweden, Spain, Turkey, and there were a few others. But they cooperated with the winner. They were selling the materials, fuel, metals and things a war requires. Uh, the Slovakia in green in the middle was very tiny and we had nowhere to run because there were thousands of miles in all directions. Uh, where, 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 and even if we reached, <laughs> reached the shore, uh, it was no way, way to cross the water. Uh, my mother understood the situation that it started resembling a Hitler threat to in every aspect of it. It was a, a German historian, Paul Hilbert, who characterized the history of Jews in this way. Uh, you may not live amongst us as Jews. Uh, which means that I stress that as, as Jews, if you convert it or uh, to Christianity or to Islam, uh, depending where you lived, uh, you, you, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't uh, try to prevent it. Then the sentence was shortened. You may not live amongst us, which means that if you left or were kicked out or expelled or deported or whatever, then you would let you live. And the Nazis came with a it was a, a last shortening of the sentence saying, uh, you may not live. And they came 
to a point where they were planning to exterminate, they call it like insects, exterminate, like annihilate, wipe out completely uh, every uh, person with Jewish uh, ancestry, including one day old baby. Uh, this was president of the, Dr. Josef Tiso. He was a priest because uh, there were not too many people who were literate and priests were, had a nice education. That's why uh, he was, he became president. And no people believed that a priest, a representative of morality and, and God, would not harm children, civilians, and families. And this unfortunately served as a Propaganda, uh, which fooled a lot of people into uh, <coughs> complacency, and uh, they died because they believed in in uh, uh, something which was not true, which was a deceit, deceitful uh, uh, idea how to uh, get the Jews to the place where they could do it without any witnesses. Uh, we were promised to be resettled to work in self-governed areas. It was not, you know, here you see how orderly deportations went. First of all, they took thousand uh, from Slovakia, thousand girls which were 16 years and over, unmarried. Then they sent the boys after them uh, to work. And then they sent parents, uh, siblings, and all the, all the generation, which means that it was a very sophisticated psychologist worked out the scheme, how to do it, uh, I would say, uh, cowardly, painlessly, and so that people would uh, just uh, not uh, restrain, uh, they would not reward, they would be disciplined and obey the law, obey, uh, the orders and go, I wouldn't say voluntarily, but without any major fights. Some people naturally were thinking differently, and I'm alive because my parents were thinking differently. You see it here, unsuspected Jews marching to their deaths. They have things with them uh, to survive the trip and to accommodate in a new place and to start working and so on. And here, this was a picture taken by some Nazi. They found it in archives of a German uh, soldier or guard. And uh, you see people like that uh, came to those concentration camps. Uh, this was a youth of Donny Kubin, uh, where I was born and raised. And here are people who are older than 14, which means that they didn't go to that school, and none of them survived the war. Uh, and again, uh, practically everybody, not practically, but everybody who was deported with parents was murdered. None of them appeared alive after the war. This is a picture uh, of a wedding of my mother's sister. My mother is here at the extreme right, and her parents, and sisters and my husbands are on this picture. Except my mother, the year later, everybody was murdered, including my mother's parents, my, my grandparents. Uh, the, here is a picture of the same, peop same people. Uh, they were just taken to those camps and murdered. Uh, beyond comprehension. Uh, father had seven siblings. And they were married, and they were my cousins, my age. And I was 12, and almost all my relatives were murdered. We remained, six people remained alive because our grandfather uh, came uh, home, and his apartment was sealed with a sign that people of his apartment were uh, deported. And <laughs> he was not deported, he was somewhere else. And he just took a train, removed his star, and and visited us, it was many hours by train uh, from Western Slovakia to the far north. And he survived the war with us. But uh, after the war, he only lasted a few 
few months because he was so disappointed. He was very religious, believed that God would uh, uh, allow anything like that happen, and it, it did happen. Uh, on this map, uh, map, map I, uh, this map explains uh, how close we were. The blue part on the bottom is Slovakia, and Auschwitz is here, which is extremely, there might be 50 miles away, but we had to cross, cross a border, a Polish border. And this way, this helped us to find out what was going on and, and, and run away, stay alive and zigzag not until we succeeded in, in uh, being liberated. Uh, we learned uh, about those death camps by accident. We helped somebody, some people in a jail. Uh, uh, we got them out of the jail and they uh, turned to be escapees from Auschwitz. Auschwitz was one of the villages. Uh, there were thousands of villages in Poland. And it, it meant nothing. It didn't have any meaning or any any uh, destination or anything, anything unusual. But they told us how those deportees come, how they take few labor, uh, younger people who are able to live few more months by uh, working in those factories. And the rest of them were told to be disinfected after a long trip. And uh, uh, remember, was they put their clothes and so on, got a soap bar of soap, went into the shower room, and then uh, when about 1,000 people were inside, uh, poisonous gas killed them in about 15 minutes, and uh, they were burned to ashes in about two hours. Which means that I found out that I was 12 years old, uh, so I sure, certainly would not be selected. I was small. I would not be selected to work, and it was a death sentence. And uh, we were like on the death row. Uh, be aware of it. And we were able to, uh, after those escapees, three days had to uh, describe the situation until we understood that some factory killing people uh, it has been a, a, a real thing and not some kind of fantasy or propaganda or, or empty threats. Uh, we didn't. We were not immediately deported because my father, as I said, was a clergyman, was a cantor, something like a rabbi in America or Canada. Uh, eventually, identical, even with more uh, duties and responsibilities. But one of them was officiating. Uh, at Jewish funerals. In the meantime, if a Jew died, they wouldn't, uh, he would not be buried by other representative of other religions, which means they kept a person like that to the end of the year where practically all Slovak Jews would be deported. Uh, our mother was a designated teacher of, of the Jewish school, and until the last child was there, were deported also. Uh, she was had a, an exempt uh, status, and uh, we, uh, my brother and I we were digging uh, holes in the cemetery. If somebody uh, died, because we were not uh, allowed to use any other labor, which means that we were so called put set aside for the later transport. It helped us naturally uh, to survive the most critical part. Uh, it, it was an attempt to, you know, like, because they had to uh, match some numbers, attempt to deport us, but we found out and avoid, avoided it. Many Jews became confused and desperate, and those two pictures are showing it. It's established in Slovakia for centuries, Jewish communities kept silently vanishing. Uh, people uh, just in the morning were not in town anymore. Uh, during the night, one wave after the other were missing, which means that we knew what was going on, and we knew that we had three choices, either to remain passive and be killed, uh, 
at the deportation destination, we already knew even technology used. Uh, second uh, alternative was to revolt and be shot on the spot because on the railroad station were soldiers and militiamen and who, uh, they wanted to avoid any, any disturbance or any delays. Uh, the third was a alternative which we have chosen. It was uh, trying to survive against all odds and become witnesses of this crime because uh, they were wiping out all witnesses together with the victims. Uh, this was really, if, if I say against all odds, in 1942 when deportations were going on, Germans were winning in all fronts and they were approaching already Stalingrad and Moscow, you know, Eastern Front, and they were on the channel, uh, you know, throwing those rockets, power one, five, two, two, into England, damaging buildings and killing people. And it looked like a healthy situation, but we didn't, uh, we never ever believed that Germans might win that war, Nazis might might be there longer than a few, few months or years. Uh, uh, this is a remark uh, I usually I speak, uh, you know, spoke hundreds of times already in schools and just to make a record straight. Uh, Jesus, who was, uh, according to Gospels, a Jewish had for uh, Jewish grandparents, he would be qualified as a Jew. He would have to wear a yellow star. Uh, and he would be deported and killed just as anybody else. And this is uh, like a reminder of anti-Semites who used uh, the difference in religions and saying that we deserved it and things like that. Uh, this is another picture if you see over the head of this painting, of this face. Uh, 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 it's a Psalm number 22, and the Gospel says that uh, he, before being executed and dying on the cross, Jesus said, God, God, why have you forsaken me? It's a Psalm 22. And uh, this is a reminder of some anti-Semites that they should be very careful because it's extremely bizarre to be a Christian and hate the Jews. Because <laughs> they wor worship, worship uh, uh, the whole religion is based on, on Judaism. Uh, anyway, back to the situation. Nobody would guess and believe that the deportation meant a death sentence because it was so unusual. You know, like, like uh, people were saying Stalin would say something, Roosevelt would say something, Churchill would say something, Pope, Pope would say something if, if um, hundreds of thousands or millions of people were slaughtered. Uh, in a factory style way, and nobody said anything. Uh, I, uh, much later, we found out that the uh, New York Times on page 24 or page 16 had four lines about it. And in a way that you could believe it or, could, uh, or don't have, didn't have to. Uh, and they were, we were Slovak citizens, uh, just a little bit different religion. Uh, also, this was a, an interesting, because sometimes I get questions, maybe I get a question about this one. Uh, there were two opinions. Uh, some people, who mostly very religious, insisted that whatever is happening in history is God's will and God's plan. And they said, if God wants us to sacrifice our lives, uh, we should not resist. We should go to the concentration camps or to death camps and, and die. Die in the, for the name, uh, of the holy name of God. But we, have a, we had a mother who was different, of different opinion. She said the other way around. God gave us strength to resist evil and live. It was not God who wanted Killed, killing people who wanted us to be dead. It was Hitler and, and the president, Slovak president Tiso, who wanted to see us dead. We are going to resist and outsmart them and go on living. And we will never, ever give up. 
which means that this was uh, behind uh, our effort, our ideology, I would say, our conviction, never give up and never give up uh, to evil people who want to harm you. Uh, if they try to rob us, we can uh, settle that and take it. But if they want to kill, kill you, you have the right to defend yourself. My brother, older brother, was extremely smart. They called him even a genius. He said, we were thinking, debating it. He said, Nazi patrols were at every corner. We didn't have post papers. And it was such a small town, they would recognize that anyway, which means that it was out of the question to, to try to pretend to be somebody else, to have papers proving that we were, our ID would not be Jewish. Uh, we didn't know how to fly, and even if we did, you know, front line, they would shoot us down even on a glider. We didn't know how to live underwater, how to breathe underwater. But he came to a very interesting conclusion. We could live like wild animals in the mountain forests uh, because a lot of uh, people in, uh, in a very harsh environment survive. And he was so thinking out all the details, how to build an underground shelter, how to breathe, how to get close to water, how to camouflage it, and how to uh, simply construct it. And here are the examples of it. When the front line came closer, and the uh, Soviet army, that kind of time they called them Red Army, uh, uh, already approached uh, Ukraine and was from one side and from the north, Poland, uh, the German army occupied and, uh, Slovakia totally. They didn't trust anymore the Slovaks who were, became very, very pragmatic and reliable, and they were uh, hesitating to put their lives into, into like all eggs into one basket. Uh, we just uh, ran into the mountains with other refugees because they came by force and it was a war situation uh, like civil a lot of civilians and homes were burning and so on which there were a lot of refugees we removed our yellow stars and rushed with them pretending to be bombed out the refugees and from that village where we ended up we tried to find a suitable place to build our shelter uh, somebody made their aerial photography, and uh, luckily it was the area where we ran, which means I can even point with a red uh, arrow the place where we have chosen to build our shelter. This was the way we did it. On the, we found a, like a ravine from both sides, like a steep uh, hill. With, on the bottom was a small creek, like one to two feet wide, just depended on the rain or, or melt, melted snow and ice. Uh, we, found, uh, uh, we found pieces of wood, like tree trunks, falling, uh, falling you know, trees. And uh, we crisscrossed them. We didn't have any nails or ropes or anything, but we have a little hatchet uh, and a trench shovel from a uh, soldier through, throughout. Uh, while running away. Here it is, an oil painting. The yellow part, we just dug out that dirt with our bare hands and really very difficult. Then we made that skeleton, which we placed inside. And this picture is showing how, how it was camouflaged. And uh, naturally, uh, when Germans took over, Gestapo, which was secret police, knew of a Every uh, Jew and political person, like communists, were hunting that just the same as, as the Jews or gypsies were also on the list to be wiped out, sent to Auschwitz or somewhere to be killed. Which means they had every name uh, uh, ready, and we were missing on the list because whoever came back and whoever couldn't escape was arrested and sent to. Uh, either by train or by those long marches to, uh, to the west, to German concentration camps, because Poland was already uh, almost taken. 
uh, which means that it shows to those uh, horse riders, armed uh, SS men and Slovak soldiers who were searching the forest for those escapees or, or partisans. Uh, in winter time, uh, in winter time, it was more difficult, uh, and the winter came very quickly. Here you see the fall, green grass, and maybe summertime, and in the peaks, snow. And in when really uh, November, December came, and January, February, it was really one or two, two feet of snow, and sometimes even deeper. And we were still in that forest, uh, believing that after a few months we'll go home. Uh, they will liberate us, but it took seven months before Slovakia was liberated. Seven months is 200 days and nights. And it's a long time to be like in a grave and uh, to stay alive. And not only that, to, to remain me mentally uh, sane because uh, such an isolation is terrible. And we made it, all of us, alive. We were robbed in, in a forest, but not by Nazis, but partisans who were parachuted, uh, Soviet partisans who were parachuted behind the enemy line to fight the Nazis, found Jews in a forest, and uh, they lined us up to be shot, give us money, give us gold, and so on. I escaped. And when I came to bury them, they found uh, they found them alive, but they were all uh, stripped uh, of their even upper clothing and everything we owned. We had there you know, like uh, backpacks and some blankets. Everything took they took just to let us freeze because they, they, I was a witness to me that they were not allowed to kill civilians. Uh, uh, which means that they believe we would freeze uh, or starve or because they were shooting after me when I was escaping, patrols would go follow the sound of footsteps in snow and would find us and, and shoot us. Uh, anyway, it didn't happen. And uh, if not for a miracle that a mineral stream of hot water like sulfur stinking water uh, because there was spas in the area uh, <laughs> helped us to, to survive another two months. Uh, many Jews, not, they were not, as I said, not only Jews, but people who were hiding in the forest uh, were murdered. And this is a larger painting I made. It's a little bit different style of painting. And uh, because trains uh, were full or busy, and it was already front line was already moving. Uh, here uh, shows this picture painting shows a march of people on the right hand side, a lot of dead bodies because you slowed down was shot, uh, and uh, at the end of it was just the same attempt to to death, and that a person who stands here. Uh, watching it uh, is obviously a, in Jewish uh, religious garbs and and uh, uh, it is a cultural distinction. Uh, it was April 4, you know, a few days ago, we celebrated our, I don't know which number of birthday. Uh, uh, in April 4, both Noemi in Bratislava, capital city, and and in we in the forest were liberated in 1945 because the whole uh, German army retreated. They couldn't defend it anymore, retreated the, so from the whole country and retreated to the Czech part of uh, Czechoslovakia. And then the uh, Soviet army was all over and on each tank and cannon was written to Berlin, toward Berlin, toward Berlin, to Berlin. Which means that this was our uh, in most important point in, in our lives, in my life, because we survived something totally impossible. There were about 70 million dead victims of the Second World War, 
and we were we were supposed to be naturally part part of it. Six of us survived, and about 60, 70 people or family did not. Uh, this is the Soviet soldiers on the Reichstag, on Parliament of German Parliament, uh, putting a, a Soviet flag. And now came the very difficult problem, how to return to normal life. Uh, Eichmann uh, had a list of 11 million Jews, and they managed to murder about half of it, about 6 million. Uh, naturally, Slovak Jews, Czech Jews were on the list. Uh, people started coming from concentration camps and telling us all terrible stories. This was a, a person, a Romanian in, living in Israel, and asked me to paint a picture of her story in the concentration camp and a sculpture on the right hand side I made from ceramic clay and fired it. We learned about the cyclone B, you know, which killed people, that poisonous gas, and how that crematoria and, uh, burn, burns their, their bodies. Sometimes 24,000 Slovak Jews ended up in a pit in the forest. They had to dig out uh, a pit and then their machine gun and uh, petroleum or some gas, gasoline uh, was uh, just burning their bodies. And then uh, a forest covered it. And there were thousands of places like that all over. A, a Ukrainian priest wrote a book about it because he started searching the country and there were hundreds of, if not thousands of places like this. Uh, six million Jews were victims. Each of them had a name and a face and life. And about one quarter of them were children, which means that about a million and a half children died uh, during that time. If we held a moment of silence for every victim, we would, it would take us 11 to 12 years. Uh, this is how we imagined they vanished in flames and smoke. And this is my carving. And uh, here is ceramics painting over ceramics and, and faces of people I remember. Uh, here also big paintings uh, with faces I remember from my family. Uh, here is how we felt, how many people felt, uh, but we never get desperate to a level of weakening ourselves because we would not have survived it. This is a ceramic sculpture I made. Uh, uh, here also same subject of sadness and, and uh, and remembering uh, those people terrified, driven to death, uh, murdered in different ways. Uh, then we tried to relieve that, and part of my healing was to depict those scenes from uh, those terrible, tragic times. Uh, even prophets would cry over the senseless slaughter. I don't know what profit they had by killing civilians, children, old people, females. Uh, anyway, not soldiers, nothing who would resist or shoot at them. Uh, this is a prayer of Yiskor Elohim. Like, remember, God remembers the souls who sacrificed, who were killed in your name because not being Jewish, being Jewish was a, a really that only crime those people committed that they were born in, in a Jewish family, in a wrong family. This is a, a wooden carving with Burns text, the same prayer uh, in it. Here are also wood burnings. Uh, we have to restart our lives. I was 15, sick after five years from school, almost illiterate, and I had to uh, come back to civilized world and restart our life. We all needed to do it, so, you know, like crying over, uh, crying over the tragedy would not help us to go on living. Uh, here are some uh, of those 
uh, ghosts of the past, uh, remembering people, you know, trying to find out what happened. And, and it took about really five to six years. It was not like any uh, one a car accident or one kind of misfortune or some kind of a uh, tra trauma uh, or a few moments or a few hours. It, it really took five, five to six years. Uh, on the top of it, we received neither apology or compensation or nobody would feel sorry for us. Uh, all I received from an office where I registered as a refugee, homeless refugee, because we didn't have anything, not even close, on, uh, uh, belonged to us. And I got about $10 uh, bar of soap because we could uh, all clay looking, and, and my shoes fell apart, which means they gave me a pair of shoes. And I have it in writing here on the bottom of it, is saying this person uh, should get a pair of shoes and a pair of soap and turned out $10 to survive maybe one week of food. I tried to immigrate to Palestine, but communist government took over, closed the borders, and before I got, because I got tuberculosis after the war, before I cured myself, we were locked in another, uh, like a prison way or like concentration camp, but if for political reasons. Uh, we returned naturally to musical instrument. We celebrated every breath we took, you know, like it was a, such a difference between that hole in a forest, dark and, and silent, and the real life around us. And uh, life cannot be stopped or limited. We immediately uh, started uh, living fully. Uh, after curing myself a little, uh, we made exams to school, three children, returned to high school. I graduated in a few years. And because I had all straight A's, uh, um, they already were sending people where they believe they should be and all people, all uh, graduates with the best marks uh, had to study chemistry because Stalin, who was a, took over Central Europe and pra Prague was the best school, which means that he 260 of those graduates and send us to study chemistry to get better explosives, better weapons and eventually conquer capitalists of the West uh, with better steel and so on. Uh, I then continued, became an engineer and a PhD in my field, and I missed those explosives because I got a little ill. I was lucky and studied ceramic engineering and become spe became specialist in glass making as an engineer scientist and uh, this was my career. In Czechoslovakia, persecution of Jews continued. We believed that we would be free, but we were not free because uh, a lot of uh, uh, Jews were known as Democrats, as people who would peace, wanted peace and uh, hated dictatorships and, and uh, Simply, communist system never agreed with Jewish ideology, particularly religion of of equality and and uh, democ and and, and uh, fairness. This was not part of the regime, which was very aggressive and uh, extremely uh, careful not to lose power. Uh, I was an engineer. I was left alone. I didn't have any political problems, but my father, who was a clergyman, had a problem. He went to a hospital uh, with some trivial thing and never came out of it. He was not even 60. My brother was an artist. Uh, he became a prime target of harassment, persecution, and threats because he wanted to have uh, freedom for uh, Artist and naturally it was all census, censorship and uh, even the Holocaust paintings or whatever, or somebody painted a little bit more modern way and not socialistic. Socialist realism was called like if a color photography has everything very realistic. 
anything like that was not allowed to exhibit, and we could not even express ourselves or or do something about uh, remembering and commemorating our dead. My grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, I remembered them, I loved them. My neighbors, schoolmates, I still remember them. Um, this was my brother who probably was uh, cowardly poisoned by some harmful radiation and he received, he, he, he became ill and uh, died 33 years old in the peak of his uh, creativity because he did not agree with, he started a magazine, he started a little theater and a gallery for young people, but nothing like that was agreed with the political system and regime. Uh, and heartbroken father, as I mentioned, uh, died two years later. But, you know, who knows what happened to him? It was no way to find out. We found out about my brother by, by reading during the one year of a little bit more liberal communism. They called it communism with a human face in 1967. And they described the way how they were uh, killing people who were not uh, accused of treason or hit by a truck and so on. This was a third way of doing it. I became really an outstanding engineer and PhD scientist. Uh, I published articles of scientific discoveries. I had all kinds of inventions and patents, as you see here. And uh, this, went, uh, this also kept me to heal a little, but it was some kind of a diversion rather than healing. Uh, 20 years under that regime, uh, finally, uh, Cuban industry, glass industry couldn't work for three years, and they decided to send their uh, real specialist. And even if they gave me two years to fix their industry, they told me if I don't fix it in six weeks, and they uh, ran their finger across their neck. Which means I spoke that language, I knew it. And in six weeks, uh, first factory worked and then the other ones. I don't have any pictures from my work, naturally, because I would have been arrested and con considered a spy or, or saboteur. But there are a few pictures here, one from the beach, which was <laughs> almost empty because people did not uh, do, do that. Uh, after returning, after nine months, we had to go and report to our bosses and return to Cuba to, to complete the assignment. It was a contract. Uh, the Cuban airplane was refueling in Canada, where uh, we both, Noemi, we were, not, we were married not even a year. Uh, we escaped from the airplane from a waiting room where we had to go, and we were arrested by Canadian border police because we didn't have visa and we were eventually uh, illegal uh, intruders into the country. We asked for political asylum and received it. And uh, we had to spend five years. I had to work and travel a lot. Uh, my passport was not, not valid which means that I received a travel document and became a state of the G. And we spent nine years in Canada, first five years before becoming citizens. Uh, we lived like, like aliens. Uh, and uh, naturally, the West allowed me to total freedom in artistic expression and uh, exhibit and do whatever I wanted to study art and to produce art and to participate in public publicizing it. And uh, I took all advantage of it. Uh, then we moved, uh, nine years later, after moving four times in Canada, we moved to the United States, where we also moved, moved uh, four times before landing in Kingston. Uh, here, when, I, when we moved to Kingston, it was in newspapers, and uh, five years after, uh, 
entering America or United States, we became both citizens here, ceremony, it was the newspapers and so on. Which means that, again, my many credentials, which helped me to live. And after 30 years in glass industry, I accepted the challenge to participate in a digital revolution. This was, uh, computers were in infancy. They were clumsy, small, and uh, it really showed some escapees from IBM uh, who, that did not believe in computers, started a company, here is a picture of it, where I worked for 14 years, invented a lot of stuff, and uh, the product was magnetic recording head, which allowed to produce uh, hard drives, hard drives allowed to make computers every half a year, capacity doubled, and uh, a digital age started. I usually uh, apologize to when I make uh, uh, lectures uh, that I contributed to the unfortunate staring of their children at, on, a com on, on uh, phones and uh, laptops instead of running around playing football. Uh, I retired at age 68 after so 44 years working as an engineer, technician, and technologist and scientist. And I became a full-time artist because I lived a little longer. It happened 24 years ago. And uh, I already, uh, this is practically the slide which explains uh, how art healed me because with every painting, every sculpture, every carving I made uh, where the subject was Holocaust, my, my memories, everyone somehow removed that heavy weight from my shoulders and from my mind. And uh, when I saw people's interest and they were asking me to explain, uh, you know, what I went through, uh, it became really a, an artist. Uh, and and uh, healing, healing through art, what eventually we are talking about tonight. Uh, there were some people who believed that how a scientist uses different kind, different parts of the brain, like right hand side brain and left hand side brain, and uh, an artist cannot be a scientist, and and scientist cannot be an artist, thing like that. And uh, it was a. a uh, it was a reporter uh, uh, in uh, uh, New York uh, who wrote in uh, an article. You see, my head is split in half. Scientists against uh, uh, against uh, uh, art, and the title is in Czech. It's in you know, Slovak language. The, the science and uh, art are two poles to contradicting uh, part of the same unit because I didn't feel any uh, problem being becoming a, an artist uh, from a completely different uh, field. My first uh, painting was a large hand written Holocaust autobiography. We lived in Philadelphia. Uh, where I took a big, huge piece of paper, uh, hard carton, and uh, painted the face on the left-hand side and wrote my story about 40 years, uh, story of 40 years between 1945, uh, when we were liberated, to 1985. And uh, when I was exhibiting it, uh, I, I remember a mother reading it to her about nine years old daughter and she was crying <laughs> and the mother kept kept reading it and I understood power of art how it, easy it is to approach human emotions through art and I started painting uh, even more vigorously and learned a profession uh, so well that an art historian called me this kind of style, what you see here, as a 
uh, extension of impressionists because they died young and uh, Cubism took over and they didn't have time to uh, make a step in development of the art of impressionists, which, uh, which was a revolution by itself. And uh, they, uh, I would say, accused me or pointed at me saying that I made that step. That's why uh, my art became even more uh, in demand to, to be shown. And you, if you see who, who, who among you is uh, studying art or knows art, that it is an original style of those little dots. Uh, this is a wood carving of mystical mysticism, which I had to study. And later on, people asked me even to teach it, because in that whole, uh, in the two, 200 nights and days, and it, we were, uh, the forest was too dense, and we didn't know if it was like night. It, it started, all kinds of voices started coming to mind, and uh, most people in the situation become uh, mentally ill. We did not. I, I did not. The contrary, it was teaching me uh, very important lessons, which I used, to, first of all, to survive, and secondly, then uh, to be a uh, very powerful inventor. As I had an exhibition in Bratislava, Slovakia, my certified paintings in the most prestigious uh, 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 exhibition hall in the country, uh, so that they appreciated that quality was there. They didn't know. They asked me for 15 paintings and then asked me for another 15. And uh, here are some catalogs of exhibition in uh, Rockland County in Prague. This one was in Bratislava in Slovakia. I had about six or seven, seven of, uh, exhibitions simply uh, in Canada and America many, many, many times. This was the most memorable, I would consider this one, because uh, Nazis produced a museum of extinct race. They would have wiped out Jews to the last baby and wanted to have a museum to be proud of it. And uh, after the war, it became a Jewish museum because they collected in it a lot of artificial, uh, 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 those uh, uh, artifacts uh, which they stole from other museums and from people. And in that museum, I had my revenge because I was alive and I was showing Holocaust paintings. And uh, this is one in, exhibited in Woodstock painted by Jeremy Hoffelt, he's a famous artist. And it was so realistic that people believed that I sat in front of that painting. That's why I took, somebody took a picture of me standing next to it. Uh, uh, I made, my art made it into an art historian book, uh, Radgar University professor. Uh, the book is called Jewish American Artists and the Holocaust, and the book was marketed by my painting, and that's why the author sent me a note saying, you know, I had I put 44 paintings into the book, and they have chosen marketing people, have chosen your painting to sell my, I, I, I'm letting you know, which means that we, we went to buy that book, and I was really surprised uh, of my own capabilities, because I still was working as, as an engineer. Uh, this was a book of poetry in Canada where my paintings made it as a, an illustration. And this is what I wanted to show you was uh, three years ago, uh, I was 90 years old. And in 2019, in a place where I was born, it used to be 2,000 people in that little town. We call it little town because it was county seat. And uh, now it's 20,000 people. And they made me an exhibition of my paintings. And here is a catalog uh, to commemorate my, or simply celebrate my 90th birthday, which was very nice of them. Uh, uh, this was a magazine, very uh, prestigious magazine, where they write about me. Here is a uh, Aish.com, hiding from Nazis. It's a, another, you see the same painting. Uh, they used to describe it. 
uh, Canadians, uh, Slovaks made a movie in Slovak language with English subtitles. It's a documentary, 42 minutes. And if you go online, uh, type in speech DVD, zero what, you will see that movie. And it's practically uh, simply uh, about how we survived it. And it's a lot of pictures. Uh, I, I got a, this very prestigious reward uh, also in Slovakia. Uh, during the COVID years, we were so busy, we didn't get the COVID at the time. Uh, uh, it was a second monography by my brother who lived in Slovakia. Uh, that book on the left is uh, half of it in Slovak, half of it in English. And on the right hand side is a little book uh, we wrote with Noemi. Uh, about our own uh, way of surviving the uh, Holocaust. And I gave a lot of lectures on all kinds of subjects which are listed on the left. And uh, here, every year, 10, 15, sometimes 20, 20 lectures uh, a year, for years, for decades. This one is from Drew University, also called, by the way, Art and the Holocaust which means that it was also a similar subject I was presenting here. This is the Baruch College. Uh, this was usually you know, hundreds of uh, uh, people who uh, listened or watched those uh, lectures. Here is your lecture, which I am giving now here, uh, advertised. And on the bottom is something I would suggest you did not miss. They made a song about Holocaust survivors. Uh, and one of them was about my life, uh, beautiful music, beautiful performances. And they made a, uh, they made a, a film, about 54 minutes documentary uh, film, which will be, shown on TV, PBS TV channel in this area is number 13, April 26, about in about two and a half weeks at 8 p.m., which means that who is interested in this subject and is uh, and likes music would see something unique. Naturally, the world remained a dangerous place. Uh, genocides continued even not only against Jews, there are all kinds of ethnic groups fighting and nations fighting. And we live in days where we even see the fight and hear about it in daily, in a daily, daily uh, uh, news. news. Uh, this is just a reminder that anti-Semitism and mental disease uh, a lot of people uh, fight for all kinds of ideas, but just to kill people just because they were born at a certain ethnic or religious uh, group is something we should not tolerate. Uh, a question I usually ask, uh, could genocides and Holocaust happen again? Unfortunately, it can, and we should all fight to prevent it and it's possible to prevent it. For both Jews and non-Jews, Holocaust remain a constant reminder because six million people murdered like that was really a uh, uh, unique historic event. Uh, we need a lot of faith, a lot of awareness, and religions sometimes help, uh, sometimes does the opposite. And here it is showing that we have a choice to be the slaves or to be free people. Uh, and uh, a reminder, if a Jews are around, that for 4,000 years we were showing that it's very difficult to destroy us, and uh, I would say impossible to destroy. Uh, and uh, this one is showing continuation, a, a hand with tattoo, which was also only practiced in Auschwitz, is a little baby uh, touching the older pe person. This chronology of my major events in my life, which I try to 
uh, say, and this is the end of the slideshow, which means that please ask a question, and I'm going to sh shut it down. Here, in case you have a uh, continuous question, you can take a picture of it, contact me, and I would uh, gladly uh, answer any questions you have. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you all for joining us this evening for the discussion at this year's 41st annual Greater Lafayette Holocaust Remembrance Conference event. My name is Rebecca klein Peshova, and I'll be moderating the question and answer portion of this program. And so many questions have come in during um, Tibor's presentation that I'm going to start by clustering them. And first of all, by letting you know, Tibor, how many people have been expressing their thanks to you for sharing your story and appreciation that you're here this evening. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see you both here today. Um, yeah, so, and there's more, you know, thank you for sharing your story and your art with us. Um, and I, I'd like to start with, with, um, with questions about hiding. There were some questions that people had about the, about your hiding experience um, that often, most of these questions are about what you ate. How did you eat in hiding? Um, did you get sick in hiding? Um, how did you deal with soldiers as they attempted to rob you? Did you encounter partisans? So here I'm, I'm clustering. There's a number of you who asked these, um, but I, I'll start there. Uh, forests are full of food. Uh, uh, it's easier to go to a supermarket <laughs> and buy, buy, you know, fill up your, your vehicle. Uh, or your bags, but uh, we, I was born there. I knew all the berries. Many are, are edible, many are poisonous. We, I knew the mushrooms, uh, which were edible. We collected them not because of survival. We collected them because it was food, a natural food. Uh, uh, in, in the fall, first months, September, October was not so bad, but when the snow fell, I had to dig uh, the snow under the snow to get some leaves. They were tiny, like a uh, quarter of an inch big strawberries. Uh, we ate every, the whole, uh, those green leaves. Uh, uh, it was so dangerous to leave that camouflage shelter that I was wiping, I was filling with a, like a hockey uh, stick curved branch. I put snow into my footsteps. If somebody saw me and shot me and would look where I came from, try to get to the, to, to the shelter, <laughs> they would not be able to. But this was our, uh, our main food were berries. Berries were, had a bush which was sticking over the one or two feet of snow uh, in a forest. Uh, when we were really dying, 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 my mother dressed as a peasant went to the village and risked her life. They sometimes, uh, no, it was just a an opportunity to get arrested, killed, or whatever. And she risked her life and brought a loaf of bread. Uh, but this was really when we were at the end of, uh, when we felt, you know, with the last drop of snow and ice, which we ate to stay alive. Uh, this is a very difficult question to answer because you know, people do not eat usually stuff they collect uh, in the forest. And it was very high in the mountains. It was not like a uh, fertile, uh, sunny uh, area where, where pine trees uh, mostly. Uh, partisans, we, we knew about partisans, but they were not as friendly as uh, any group of uh, Soviet partisans who were parachuted robbed us and, and tried to kill us. If I didn't escape, they would probably shoot us all. And I, when I returned to bury them, 
Very, my family, they were alive, but you know, with our clothes and standing in snow in underwear. And everything they took, they didn't need berries. We collected, I collected in a forest. Uh, and they took it anyway just to kill us by starvation. Uh, if it is a specific question, I can answer. Okay. So um, this is basically what people were asking about that experience. And, and then I, I would like to, to ask at this point also, because you're here too, Naomi, um, if you can tell us about how you survived. You were also in hiding during the war. If you can tell us a little bit about that, as much as you're willing to share. I, I was too young. I don't remember. When war was over, I was 22 months old. That's why I didn't even know that I was in the war uh, or I was hiding. I had 14 years advantage <laughs> <laughs> in experiences. Yes. And my parents they didn't tell us anything. Yeah. Even after the war, when I was 14 years old, I, I was told in school, they asked me, how come you are alive? And I came home and asked my parents that, uh, that question. And they told me that we were supposed to be killed. But I had no idea. They didn't tell us, my parents. What I know about the war, I know it from Tibor, not from my parents. Yeah. Right, yeah. They left memoirs. Uh, father wrote, wrote uh, yeah, me, my father wrote memoirs, and that's why I know what happened to us. But but otherwise, I I don't remember anything. They didn't tell children. Yeah, it was and too then, drastic. Yeah, and you were too young. Yeah, there was another question. Thank you um, for for talking about this. And I, there was a question for Tibor here about what happened to your mom after the war. Um, uh, mother was a teacher. She went back to teaching while we were back to school. And uh, she lived about 82, almost 82 years old, teaching to the last moment. She spoke many languages. Uh, uh, she, she was teaching music. And... Uh, People believe that, uh, you know, she was like create, teaching few generations of people who were very successful because my mother taught them languages and they would become uh, directors of television stations, you know, like, like television uh, or filmmakers and people, important people because uh, of... Uh, well, and, 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 and they were st started coming to me saying, we are so grateful what your mother did for us. And I have uh, dozens and dozens, or maybe even hundreds of friends, particularly in, in Slovakia, uh, with, uh, who, who uh, thank me for successful life they had, I still have. May I ask you another question about post-war and thinking about you? Um, you said that when you went to Cuba, um, you were already married. And I wondered if, you know I'm going to ask this, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> we had to escape because we had two weddings. First of all, in a communist country, uh, we had to have a, only civil wedding, which means the religious weddings were invalid legally, uh, meant nothing. Uh, but it was a period in 1967, a period of communism with a human face. Uh, the government understood that they bankrupting the economy, and they wanted to have a little more business with the West, and capitalism will introduce a little injection that is mean for freedom, private property, and so on. Naturally, in August 68, half a million Soviet soldiers took over Czechoslovakia and uh, proven that there is no such thing as communism with human face, as a beast face. And uh, this triggered a, uh, also a reason for us to escape, because we had a Jewish wedding 
it was very, uh, about 400 people came to see such a curiosity. Uh, during that uh, period of uh, little liberal, more liberal, politically liberal area. After uh, uh, the Soviet army came, it was politically very tough and we would have paid for it. That's why this was one of, I call it 10 reasons. Today, somebody called from Spain asking me the same question. <laughs> well, uh, can you tell me the reason why you escaped? from such a wonderful country, Czechoslovakia. And I was ex telling him, you know, there are about 10 reasons why I can give you in a hurry five or seven. <laughs> uh, it was just uh, enough is enough. To live without freedom, uh, people don't know what it means before losing freedom. And if you don't fight for freedom, you lose it. Because there's always somebody who wants to control you. And it doesn't matter what regime and what political or economic system it is. And we have been through quite a few of them. Yeah. You certainly have. Yeah. I, I'd like to go on to the, those questions now about art. Um, the, there's a lot of questions here asking about art, and some of them are really quite sophisticated questions. Um, so, I first, love them. <laughs> so um, you know, first there's a question about um, okay that that says art is subjective, and everyone has their own interpretations of it. How do you feel when others who were not alive during the Holocaust and never experienced it relate to your artwork? in different ways than you intended? Uh, I, I can, uh, in your uh, advertising, it's a picture which is uh, those faces your artist put on those railroad. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I showed that picture to some people and they say, ah, oh, people are coming out of the factory, it's a five o'clock, 5 p.m., <laughs> which means that you are right. People only understand what their capacity, mental capacity, their own experience, imagination uh, would take. Uh, but I try to speak through emotions to people who are uh, after freedom, after beauty, after uh, some kind of a social justice. And uh, those people who are tuned properly uh, appreciate the message and who is on a lower level of understanding at least see some people doing something and would say that he has a longer nose and he has a shorter nose or the horse cannot fly, how come the horse is flying and so on. Which means that it is, it is very uh, uh, individual and it depends on uh, practically experience and ability to, to s imagine and understand. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, every person has a different point of view, a different way of looking at things. And that's why human race is so interesting. I, I'm going to draw from a question which just came in that's related to some of these about, you know, was making the art for you itself a religious experience? Um, what parts of making the art do you think constituted a healing process for you? Um, is there any relationship between any religious component of doing the art and of um, and of healing through the art? Uh, genocide is not limited to one ethnic or religious group. There are genocides in Rwanda. There were genocide now. Now we have a war of a superpower uh, trying to subdue a, a former member of that uh, superpower, let's say, Soviet Union and so on, which means that it is not, uh, I used that religious garb to characterize 
that this particular case of injustice or murder or genocide is related to the Jews. How would you, if I wanted to paint uh, Rwanda, certainly that person who, st who, was, who was standing there in my paintings would look differently uh, and would be differently dressed and would be environment would be different. Which means that, first of all, it's symbolism. Secondly, I got extremely good religious education, but not from the books, <laughs> from the real life, <laughs> from talking to God <laughs> and not to reading about some instructions, uh, or rituals, uh, or liturgy, which again could be related to level of understanding. Most people are not sophisticated enough. I saw religion in real historic events since I was a child. My father was a very religious person, and he was a Jewish reverend, a cantor, and in a function, functioning as a rabbi, which means that I got also uh, uh, ideology, because Jews don't have theology, because creator is invisible, and we know nothing about creator, except we can relate through creation to intentions of creator. All other religions I know are using uh, humans or animals or objects or uh, planets or, or some kind of a stars as their gods. But all those things were created. Uh, to go to the source of who created life and how it was uh, maintained and, and spread and so on, it goes far beyond four and a half billion years <laughs> of uh, so-called age of the universe. And I'm deeply interested in those questions since I was a child. And I talked to something or somebody during those 200 days in, in like in a grave in darkness and silence. And I was explaining things which <laughs> you don't find in books. And I don't know who was giving it to me and which language it was uh, said. Uh, which means that religion is a face in something. And again, it depends on the level of understanding of the person, of education or indoctrination, <laughs> or even forcing people into beliefs, or else we be, they, be, they be punished if they say, or burn that stake for being a heretic. Which means that all those things I already experienced as a child. Naturally, it reflects in uh, my uh, writings and in my uh, art and in my expression, visual expression of things. And it also appeared in a song you will see about song where I cooperated with a songwriter and she asked me, uh, can you tell me what music excites you, what music you would uh, uh, makes you makes you uh, a uh, simply a melody which uh, haunts you, and uh, if you hear that song, you will understand that it applies not only to visual art but also to sounds and music. And it will be on the PBS twenty six of in about a week and a half. April twenty six of April. I, I'm, I know we'll all turn tune in to that. Uh, I had a question that was coming through several times. Um, people here, we are at Purdue, right? And there are people who are very curious about your inventions. Now, what did you, what did you make? Uh, uh, first of all, there were some uh, ways of making glass products. They were the first, the first big one was by using tiny ingredients in glass batch. It's a mixture of raw materials uh, which uh, are melted into glass. Uh, I added something less than 1% into it and was able, and this was my PhD thesis, I able to speed up melting by 40%, which means that you have a factory making, let's say, 100 tons of glass. The following day, or in a few days while the process is introduced, you are able to make 140 
uh, tons of glass per day. By keeping the same people, same machines, same factories, you just need more materials to ship uh, to, to, which means that this was one of, one of them. Uh, there were several products. Uh, then they were patents about uh, testing uh, glass defects and by looking at them through a machine a apparatus, which is in, was in one of those slides, by looking at it in a cross section, find out what, what went wrong in a melting process or in a forming process, which means that for a technologist in a glass factory where uh, five uh, things can go right and thousand things can go wrong, and all thousand things disqualify selling the product, it was an incredible invention as the whole world practically bought that, that uh, little, little I, I, I can even show it to you. Anyway, which means that there are about a dozen and a half uh, patents. Uh, first of all, let me explain something which I believe is missing here. Chemistry is made by, uh, by uh, combining different materials, usually in a liquid form. Is that dissolved and then combined to make a reaction? Glass is not, uh, glass reactions are not made that way. Its powders are mixed, uh, about the 11, 10, 10, 11 ingredients, and they are exposed to extremely high heat. That high heat uh, is much higher for glass making than to make steel, which means that anything you look around yourself would melt or turn to ashes in temperatures glass is made. The glass was made only, invented only once in life, in, in the history of humankind, probably five, six thousand years ago, maybe four. Uh, and uh, to be a scientist in this field was very difficult because your instruments you usually use in scientific research or scientific uh, analysis would all melt. <laughs> How you study something as hot without destroying the equipment. Scientists have chosen not to go into glass science because it was dangerous. Uh, fuel has to be used, which could explode and, and damage everything. I was, I was trained by life. I survived five years or so three years on a death row. I was fearless, very strong. And I went to that field and because scientists uh, were in laboratories where it was probably air conditioning or, or very nice, safe environment, uh, I did not mind to go into dangerous things which might explode and burn myself or, 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 or damage buildings <laughs> or furniture and so on. And that's why in that field, dangerous field, I have invented things which nobody else would even touch because it, it was it required uh, courage, uh, not only wisdom or some kind of an experience. And it gave me a tremendous advantage. And uh, Ch Czech glance uh, had an incredible uh, experience in glass making, much higher in Central Europe because it was sitting on a coal as a fuel. Uh, and uh, in that area where I worked for 20 years, uh, my school was absolutely outstanding. The school was the best school in Europe, next to some uh, Munich University. You know, al alchemy school <laughs> was known in the 1300s in Prague already. This is where I studied 700 years later. And uh, I absorbed absolutely everything. Just kiss club. <laughs> I, I was lucky to get into a field which was not explored uh, yeah. properly. May I ask you, so I have a question coming up here that is a little, changing gears a little bit. And it's about where people might be able to buy your art or see your art. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the last year before COVID, 
2019, I gave nine, uh, tw 26 lectures. <laughs> and some of them in Europe, some of them in Canada, some of them in this country. Now I do it on Zoom as you, uh, as we are doing it just this moment. Uh, and uh, this week I had five actions. And tomorrow somebody from New Paltz is coming coming to, for her master's degree to take some pictures. Uh, I had no time to even finish my web page and advertise and sell. But people coming here and they somehow online uh, information penetrated, people talk to each other, and people are coming and occasionally uh, by, by art. But now I believe after this film, uh, which is going to be the broadcast in, by PBS, I believe that uh, interest would increase and I would have to set aside time, time stop talking to students so much and start, uh, you know, like... Selling God. Selling <laughs> art. <laughs> Finally, you know? turn it into some money or something, at least some imp more important people would uh, have that art preserved. Maybe Can you some do both? Reserves. Can you do both? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, I managed to do both, like mm -hmm. right hand side of the brain, left hand side of the brain. Then it's a front row and back row. <laughs> it's a reptile brain, mammal brain. Yeah, I use them all. May I ask you one final wrap up question here, which is it's a question um, about current events. Um, but more generally, saying, given given the current events um, and what we what we see unfolding um, on the news, what about your experience? Do you want people to apply to their lives today? Uh, the most important is to understand what's going on, because digital age is even more dangerous in spreading lies, information, or, you know, each organization or group of people or nationality or, or country has own interest in surviving, in having advantage economically, some larger units politically, you know, controlling neighbors and, and superpowers compete for total control of, of the global economy or global political powers uh, and so on, which means that uh, to understand those relationships is number one, because then you can orient yourself, because each group has its own agenda and naturally all deformed information bent to serve their purpose is a money-making or political power keeping power or acquire power, take it from somebody else and keep it, which means that it is uh, knowledge of the truth is the most important thing. Do not trust every message you receive because it's bent to serve something or somebody. And af after you understood those interests of those groups, then you can orient yourself and do the best you can, because you cannot change too much, the best you can uh, to serve the public or to serve, serve uh, you know, like uh, uh, make life, uh, leave a word better than you, you, you entered it, <laughs> I would say. And this, that's all you can do. And you can do it in a, your small circle. And now with digital technology, we can, you, now, now two of us are talking to you through hundreds of miles, which is very uh, interesting. But uh, spreading lies can be done equally efficiently, which means that this would, I would say, uh, I, I, uh, when we had a session, a few days ago, I said, don't get food as a slogan. Uh, don't get uh, misinformed uh, because it might lead you to slavery or it might lead you to poverty. Because you would give up something 
which is precious to you. Yeah. Okay. Knowledge, education, and little mistrust. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us and for talking with us um, and answering a good number of the questions which came in. I hope, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to, to everyone that we weren't able to get to everything, but I, um, I tried to cluster these and, and ask questions that, that most of you were interested in. Um, it means a great deal to all of us here, the students, educators, members of the community, and the planning committee to me that we've been able to have this conversation. Uh, I will now turn the floor back over to Sarah Powley, um, but before I do, just allow me to extend special thanks to her for her tireless efforts to bring this event and many other meaningful events into being over the years. So thank you also to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Timor. So many thanks are coming in on the chat for your talk tonight, for telling us your story and for sharing your art and especially for helping us understand how the art helped you to express the inexpressible. And I want to thank the audience for joining us tonight and remind you of the presentation that Tibor will be making um, on the 26th of April at 8 p.m. on PBS, so check your local listings. This conference began 41 years ago um, through the work of Rabbi Gedalia Engel, who was the director of Hillel at Purdue at the time. Since that time, it has been an entirely volunteer effort to bring these programs to the community. And I want to thank our sponsors in the community and the sponsors at Purdue University and all of the individual donors who support us financially and make it possible to present this programming. I also want to thank all of the committee members they're listed here. All of them have worked very hard. Some of us are on screen and some of us work behind the scenes. And we appreciate everything everyone does because everything they do matters. So thank you for attending the 41st Annual Greater Lafayette Holocaust Remembrance Conference. Have a good evening. <laughs>